Happy to welcome to Forward Guidance, Marco Papich, Chief Strategist at the Clock Tower Group and author of Geopolitical Alpha. Marco, uh, great to have you here. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure, Marco. How about we start off and talk about what is geopolitical alpha? Uh, what does that mean? And yeah, I think uh, geopolitics is has been seen in finance for a very long time as a risk, as something that is ex exogenous to your investment process. So basically, you spend some time thinking of what investments are going to work out, and then geopolitics shows up and scuttles um, your, your outlook. And what I've been trying to tell investors for the past you know, 15 years is that that's not the way to really think about it. Geopolitics is just one of many different variables and factors that you should think about as you're creating your investment process. And, and so that's, that's the first kind of a philosophical approach to thinking about geopolitics. It's not exogenous. It, sh it should be endogenous to thinking of your investment view or your asset allocation. Now, geopolitical alpha is when something does happen <laughs> that you did not expect. And it's, you know, it's about generating alpha because the market misprices geopolitics, either to the uh, downside or to the upside. And what I always tell clients is don't think of, you know, your job as being a geopolitical analyst. That's not what it is. It's really about figuring out whether the market has overreacted. And in my experience, the market almost always overreacts to geopolitical events, which is which which finds me in a very interesting position where I'm supposedly a geopolitical expert quite often who quite often tells investors, like, don't worry about it. It's cool. You know, whereas most geopolitical experts are there to I mean, to be fair, they're there to scare you and they're there to tell you that you need to call them again, in three months or six months or 12 months, and hopefully put them on a retainer because the world will end because Israel and Hamas are at war. And my argument is almost always it, it won't end. And actually, you should just buy risk assets whenever something like that happens, because it almost never really matters. Yeah. So someone making the call in 2015, you, you got to sell your Apple stock because of tensions between Apple and in China. I mean, that call not only has zero value, but had a lot of, of, of negative value. So you're saying that it's almost always overpriced, but is there that tail risk scenario where let's say a, a US investor invested in Russian equities in January of 2022, I mean, I think those are worth literally zero. So is there that tail risk where, you know, things can go to, to absolute zero, but you, you just think that that is, it, it happens, but it's improbable. That's, that's actually a great example because I was one of those people saying that there is value in Russian assets. In that particular case, Russian assets were really cheap. And the probability of an invasion was difficult to gauge because, how do I put this delicately? It was so stupid to invade Ukraine, which has ended up being correct. I mean, we can just talk about all sorts of ways in which that invasion has gone wrong. And people who understand war and who understand how, you know, conflict unravels saw just how difficult it would be for Russia to gain control over a large uh, part of territory using a force that was just simply not at all competent or, um, or really not just competent, but it wasn't really big enough. You know, 180,000 Russians went into Ukraine trying to basically conquer a territory the size of Western Europe. So in that particular case, yeah, a particular asset tied to that conflict can go to zero. But what I'm really talking about are the big assets. You know, I'm talking about S&P 500. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about bonds. I'm talking about the macro assets that people associate with some nebulous conflict in a nebulous region and expect them to be affected because of Russia, Ukraine, or Israel, Hamas. That never happens. Like literally, I'm not saying almost never, I'm saying it never happens. Wait, sorry, what never happened? What never happens? S&P 500 reacting over a longer period of time to a geopolitical conflict. It's, it's never happened. I mean, 1973 Yom Kippur War is the only time that S&P 500 actually ended six months after the conflict down. Uh, I would argue that didn't have to do with the actual war itself. But if you go through every single geopolitical conflict since the Second World War, big risk assets did not react. You know, regionalized ones like Israeli stocks or Russian equities, fine, you can say that's, 
you know, those might, but not the big macro assets. Yeah, I guess 1973 Yom Kippur War, you can tie that maybe directly to the, the price of oil going up a ton in the Yom Kippur War. And because you, you know, rather humbly pointed out your, your call on Russian equities not working out, I want to highlight a call that, that you know, really aged fantastically last year, which was at the top of oil prices. T- tell us what the narrative was and tell us why you, you know, kind of leaned into that, that short commodity trade. Yeah, so that's a good example of how to generate geopolitical alpha even when you're wrong. You know, if you have a framework for thinking about geopolitics, you're not just kind of like wandering aimlessly. It really helps. So my framework is to focus on material constraints to conflict. In the case of Russia, Ukraine, uh, I definitely underestimated the probability of Russian intervention in Ukraine. You know, I said it was 50-50. It ended up being obviously a lot higher that Russia would invade. So made a mistake. But so why did I underestimate the probability of Russian intervention in Ukraine? Because of a series of material constraints to Russia invading the country and being successful in doing so. In other words, it was very clear to me that Russia would fail if it did invade Ukraine. So why would they do it? It would be a mistake. Well, they did it anyways. And when they did it, a lot of analysts said, well, now that they've done something like this, clearly there's nothing stopping them. They will mobilize millions of Russians. They'll use tactical nuclear weapons. They'll stop at nothing to get to Kiev. And I said, nah, I don't think so. I think my my framework still works. I think Putin made a mistake. He's now going to meet face-to-face with material constraints. And as he does that, the conflict will dissipate into irrelevance from a market's perspective. And therefore, something like oil risk premium, which was associated with a potential abrogation of supply or Russian you know, s- decision to stop exports by themselves to punish the West, that's just an overstated risk. And that's exactly what ended up happening. What, what was much more relevant to oil prices was the macro context, which at the time included a very, very slow Chinese economy, zero COVID. Their imports just were you know, falling off the cliff oil imports and also non-oil imports, China's economy was slowing down, oil prices were going up. It was a divergence that was basically unsustainable. And so that's where we called the top in oil markets, but not just oil, also commodities. We also called the bottom in the euro because there was just a mass hysteria that Europe will like fall apart because of this conflict. And the conflict eventually became trapped in a part of Ukraine that's not that geopolitically relevant. You know, the oblasts that we're talking about Kherson, um, at one time Kharkiv, not anymore, Saporizhia, and then Donetsk and Luhansk are just not that relevant to global geopolitics. And that meant that the geopolitical risk premium that had been bid up just absolutely collapsed throughout 2022. Now, what's interesting about that call is, again, it comes out of a mistake. You know, but because you have a framework, it allows you to actually continuously make forecasts, not just have one lucky shot. And and I compare a lot of people who got like the invasion right. They got it right, but then they subsequently made a lot of egregious mistakes because they kept taking half court buzzer beaters. You know, and it was like, oh, well, Putin has done this crazy thing. Why wouldn't he do six other crazy things? And he never did. In fact, on March 23rd, really just one month into the war, the Russian defense ministry basically said like, oh, we succeeded our first phase of operations. We're going to withdraw from Kiev. They didn't succeed anything. They basically admitted defeat. And since then, you know, they haven't really ramped up in terms of invading Ukraine again and again and again. It just hasn't happened. Right. And I think maybe key to your call on oil was that regardless of what's going to happen in, with geopolitics and the war, Russia is going to be exporting oil and that the Western embargoes of oil are mainly for PR reasons with you know, inflation close to 10%, that oil is, is going to find a, a place and you know, oil, most barrels get sold. Like you, It's impossible for a barrel of oil to, to disappear. Looking at the, the war in Ukraine now, how would you characterize it right now in the world of geopolitics and then in the world of alpha of markets? How do you think it? Uh, what the impact will be? Because also, as, as you say, they're not always the same thing. Sometimes you get the geopolitics right, but the market's wrong. Sometimes you get the geopolitics wrong, but the market's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. And we as investors have to understand that our job isn't really to get geopolitics right. You know, and by the way, there's an analogy to sports. Like if you're betting on an NFL game, 
you don't really care who wins or loses. You just care whether you're covering the spread. That's how I try to explain to investors. You're not in this game to try to figure out who's going to win or cheerlead one side or another or hope that one side wins or not. You can do that as a human being. But as an investor, <laughs> you want to cover the spread. So in case of the war in Ukraine, I think it's been over, you know, for the last 12 months. Obviously, there's the tragedy of human loss and, and Ukrainian offensive has gone on and many uh, Ukrainian soldiers have lost their lives in this offensive, which has failed. Uh, and I think you could have seen it from a mile away that it was going to fail. It was rushed. I think Kiev has engaged in the offensive against Russian held, you know, parts of Ukraine. I think they rushed it. And I feel they, I feel that they felt pressured to show success to the West. Like, hey, your investment is not wasted. Look, look what we've done. Well, they haven't done anything. It's been paltry. And I think it's been an egregious mistake that's cost Ukraine a lot of equipment and a lot of men, a lot of material. That's going to cost them for the next, you know, five years because it's going to be very difficult to launch another substantive offensive, maybe ever, but certainly this decade. And so this conflict has effectively been frozen for 12 months. Now, it's politically incorrect to say that, because then you're being, you know, alarmist or, you know, like you're being a pessimist and Ukraine must win. You know, that's literally what every policymaker in the West kind of ends every speech with, um, which is great. Like Marco must get abs. You know, I can keep saying it all I want, but it's not going to happen unless, you know, I do something about it. So it's a really important issue because it, it really if you step back and you look at the borders between Russian and Ukrainian troops, it's very, very clear that they have been ossified for 12 months. They haven't moved at all. And so by any definition, this is a frozen conflict. It's already there. I think Russia is comfortable with that. And I don't think they're going to try to pursue any more offensive operations, at least not of any large scale. I also don't think they're competent enough to do so. And I think Ukraine is exhausted as well. So this conflict is at an end of really like being a catalyst for, for a, a further geopolitical you know developments if you will also i think it's pretty clear that the west has lost patience like the public has lost patience i mean the us you have an election where you could have an outcome where you have a government that doesn't want to support ukraine we already had an election in the netherlands uh poland perhaps west's tip of the spear when it comes to russia ahead of their election this year you know the, the incumbent government abandoned a deal they had to kind of import Ukrainian agricultural products. I mean, this is Poland we're talking about. No, this isn't some country on the periphery. This is the country on the front line of West's defense against Russia. And even ban Ukrainian products. Yes, even oh, wow. they ahead of ahead of their election, they basically equivocated on their support for a country that's right on the border and that clearly matters. It, look, Ukraine may not strategically matter for a lot of countries, but it matters for Poland. And even they equivocated because of domestic politics, which tells you that they, we're, we're at the limit. We're at the end of Western support, I think, for Ukrainian offensive operations against Russia. And I think that, you know, the writing is on the wall, whether Kiev accepts it or not. And, and I think that that's fine. You know, the, the conflict will be frozen. At the end of the day, while that may sound pessimistic or maybe even pro-Russian to some, you know, people in the West, the truth is Kiev is independent. It fought off the invasion by the Russians, and Ukraine remains outside of the Russian sphere of influence. And I think those are all, you know, positives from a Western perspective. The fact that some of their territories are going to remain controlled by Russia, you know, it is what it is. Life goes on. Now, from the market perspective, I think that this has been clear to the market, even though it hasn't been clear to the Economist or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or Foreign Affairs, certainly. But the market has figured this out. I would argue to your to answer your question on geopolitical alpha, there has not been any geopolitical alpha to generate out of this conflict since September of 2022, when my team and I went long the euro tactically and also long European industrials, which worked really well in that fourth quarter of 2022, where that last remaining geopolitical risk premium drained out of the markets because of Russia Ukraine war. Market news in September 2022 that this war is over. Okay, and so you say the the conflict is is almost over. So you think that the current like battle lines will be everything that's owned by Russia, controlled by Russia now, will go to Russia, and there will be, will be a 
a peace deal? And then also, you know, what gives you confidence that the conflict will end? Because, you know, in, in many conflicts, like six months into, you know, World War One, England says, well, we're, we're all out of we're all out of money, we're all out of resources. If people want to go to war, like the, the resources can be found. You know what I mean? Everything will be sacrificed for war. Fair. That, that's that's a good point. That's fair. Uh, Russia doesn't really want to do that, though. You know, support for the war in Russia is waning in terms that not that Russians feel that it was a mistake. Russian, the polling we have, which, you know, may not be that good, but the polling we have is showing that Russians continue to believe that the war was correct, but they don't want to incur any more pain. So there's no more support for further mobilization in Russia for the conflict. And the other issue is, so you mentioned a peace conference and you mentioned that the oblast would go to Russia. That is not what I'm saying at all. And this is something that I've said since February 22nd. Uh, there will never be a peace deal. You know, this conflict will not end with a, with a solution. It won't end with the good guys or the bad guys winning. It will just dissipate and ossify. And that's what's happened. You know, that, that's, that's a reality that's been going on for six months. I mean, just our, our government, our foreign policy elites don't want to accept it. But we haven't had any movement in territory for, you know, basically 12 months. And so what that means is you can have a conflict that just freezes the way the South Korea and North Korea are now two separate countries. But they never actually had a peace deal that concluded that conflict. Similarly to the situation between Serbia and Kosovo, where, you know, Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo's independence and neither do many countries, including Western countries like Spain, which is a member of the EU. And so similarly in this case, I'm not at all saying that like Ukraine will ever be okay with these oblasts, including Crimea, being part of Russia. No one's going to accept that. But again, you know, who cares? Like too bad for the West and Ukraine. They are under control of Russia. Similarly, Russia is not going to get official recognition of them because too bad what they think. The West is just not going to do it. So that's how this conflict ends. And I would argue it's, you know, the market has basically called this already. And not that I believe market is an efficient mechanism or that it's all knowing. It's just that the market kind of sniffed out already last year that this isn't going anywhere. It's certainly not going into World War III. And it's certainly not going into some sort of a Russian attack against wider, you know, NATO territories or, or Europe uh, in general. Also, I think to your point, that part of my call on oil was this realization that the West wasn't really that committed to it. You know, that's also very important. I mean, the West could have embargoed Russian oil and said, we're not going to get a drop of oil out of Russia. And that certainly was not how that oil embargo was structured. So there's an element here where both sides are not willing to expand this to a wider conflict. Got it. And so so you don't think there will be a peace deal, but you, you do think there will be a some sort of ceasefire because you know the battle lines aren't changing. But you know in World War One the battle lines weren't changing, but it was you know it was incredi incredibly uh, violent, Ton tons of casualties. So you think that not only will the lines of control freeze, but the the fighting will at some point cease, and there will be a effective ceasefire. Uh, I think so. I mean, it doesn't have to be an official ceasefire, but look, I mean, hitting your head against the wall is it, like eventually you faint, you know, like you lose consciousness. And that's what Ukraine has been doing. It's hitting its head against the wall. It does not have the offensive military platforms necessary to defeat the Russians. It just does not. 150 tanks are a joke. You know, they're, they're a joke. Uh, a, a tank lives four days in a battlefield. Why? Because they break down. They, they don't use highways. Tanks mm -hmm. go through like the countryside. And so they break down quite a bit. So giving Ukraine some fifth generation, you know, fighter jets or advanced uh, tanks is just not enough. They need maintenance. They need supply chains. They need the ability to fix them in the battlefield. They need domestic production. They need a hell of a lot more than 300. Um, and that just has not been supplied to them. Ukraine cannot continue these offensive operations for a very long time. And therefore, I think that we are where we are. This is where we're going to be stuck. And eventually, Ukrainian officials are themselves going to have to slow down the pace of offensive operations. Now, you might say, well, why don't the Russians just mobilize and do then, you know, try to take Kiev again? Mm -hmm. Well, because they have proven extremely incompetent in doing so. And maybe in five years, they'll 
feel confident that they can now do it again. But for the time being, I don't think that there's any evidence that Russia has the ability or the political support for further offensive operations. They're going to basically declare this a victory. The Ukrainians stopping an offensive, the, the cause of that will be them running out of sufficient weaponry and, and armor. So in other words, the U.S. and, and NATO not giving them enough because, you know, you look at Zelensky a lot more than I do. But when I, when I hear, you know, Ukrainian leader Zelensky talk, he seems pretty intent on taking the rest of Ukraine back. So look, my framework is really focused on not listening to policymakers, you know, at all. Okay. Okay. And this is something. And this is something that's really interesting to me, Jack. Like, who cares what a CEO of a company says? Yeah, I get. Most, I get that. Yeah. You know, most investors have a very acrimonious position towards company management. They're they're trying to sell us something on quarterly calls. You know, Zelensky. Absolutely. And, yeah, and Zelensky and other policymakers are doing the same. Not because they're crooks. Not because they're evil. But like, God bless Zelensky, obviously, he has to say that he is going to reconquer every inch of Ukrainian territory. I mean, that's that that has to be his stated objective. Otherwise, he is in violation of his constitutional, you know, role. But material constraints are far more relevant. And material constraints to Ukraine are vast. It's not just the, you know, the tools at their disposal. So has the West given them enough offensive platforms, like as an example? But it's also actually the biggest constraint to the Ukrainian uh, leadership is the median voter in the West, which I can empirically prove to you is moving away from the blank checks. Mm. Like the thesis that like we're just going to keep giving Ukraine blank checks. And he, look, here's the reason for that. It's not because like evil Trump is in, in cahoots with, Trump, uh, with Putin. That's not the reason at all. It's very simple, actually. Ukraine is strategic to the West, like Ukrainian independence and it being outside of Russian sphere of influence, that is a cause worthy of a fight. I would argue most Westerners believe that. I think most median voters across the different democracies in the West believe that Ukraine should remain independent. But should Ukraine control Donetsk? Like before this conflict started, did you know where Donetsk is? You know what I mean? Like, eh. Does Ukraine need to control every square inch of its territory for the West to be safe and for the West's, you know, bulwark against Russia to work? And the answer is no. And so that's where there's a disconnect. Ukraine obviously naturally wants to reconquer every square inch of its territory. But as far as most people in the West are concerned, Ukraine has already won by pushing the Russians out of Kiev and by remaining independent and remaining, most importantly, a buffer between the West and Russia. Now, this is a cold-hearted reality. Again, no one's going to print this in The Economist or Wall Street Journal because it's, like, not palatable. It's, you know, politically incorrect to say, like, ah, we've done enough. You know, no, obviously, you want to support your ally who sacrificed for Western, you know, interests. But I'm just telling you where the future is headed, at least in my view. I think that uh, blank check to Ukraine is becoming very expensive politically and economically for many in the West. And so, therefore, it will stop. It, it won't continue. Hey, everyone. We're about to get back in the action. But before we do, let me give you a lowdown on what's been brewing at Blockworks. Come March next year in the heart of London, we're bringing together hundreds of the world's heavyweight asset managers. I'm talking about the big hitters, fund managers, allocators, payment providers, and the major high-frequency traders. They'll all be converging at Digital Asset Summit London, the mother of all digitally focused conferences in the institutional space. If you're curious about what the big money is up to in the digital asset scene, this is the event for you. We're diving deep into the intersection of macroeconomics and crypto, dissecting where we're at at the market cycle, and we'll be getting into the nitty gritty of real world assets. So think stable coins and on-chain treasuries, it's all in mix. I'm gonna be there and so are the forward guide superstars. Michael Howell is gonna be there. There's a rumor that Joseph Wang is gonna be there. I don't know who started that rumor, but people are saying that. We're also getting into the minds of allocators, so you get a front row seat to what the big crypto money managers are cooking up these days. And because you're a dedicated Forward Guidance listener, here's an exclusive treat. Use code FG20 to get 20% off. Just hit that link at the end of this episode, so gear up, because I'm looking forward to seeing you in sunny London town come March. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. What you're saying previously, very interesting point about how 
often the end to a conflict is not some we get a lot of people, you know, wearing their fancy suits and dresses at a conference and there's a peace deal and they take out their quill and they sign it. It's more of just an understanding that, hey, let's let's stop stop the violence. And it's an unofficial, unspoken uh, kind of cessation of, of conflict. On that topic, let's let's move to Israel, you know, Hamas's attack on Israel on, on October 7th, their, their, their terrorist attack. And you know, Israel is, is striking back very hard. I, I just so you know, this is the first time we've you know, talked about this on this platform. I try and stay in my, my lane. So this is, this is our first time. Yeah. What, what are your overall thoughts? First, like, let's get your, your, your in-depth geopolitical take, and then we can you know, move on to the markets. Okay. So yeah, look, I mean, in my experience, Israeli-Palestinian issues, conflicts have never had a market impact. We'll get to that later, as you say. But also geopolitically, they've never spread beyond the Levant, beyond Israel. This is a security issue for Israel. Hamas conducted the most egregious terrorist attack ever on Israeli soil. So that's the difference. The difference here is a quantitative difference. But qualitatively, this conflict has been going on for a long time. And it's never really spread beyond Israel and Palestine, certainly not in the last 25 years. So why is that? And the answer is that the Arab states that surround Israel I mean, and I'm saying this from their behavior. I'm not saying this from what they say. But from their behavior, we can infer that most of them are not really interested in Palestinian issues at all. And and I would argue that the radicalization of Hamas and other groups in Palestine are in, in part a result because there has been no support outside for their cause, particularly among the Arab states that surround Israel, that you would assume would have an interest in sort of supporting Palestinians in some way. That's never happened. And so that's very important because it means that the conflict can remain very, very violent, very egregious, you know, where lots of people can die on both sides, but it doesn't necessarily have an easy way that it graft itself onto the regional issues. I mean, Hezbollah, the group that, of course, it's Shia, it's not Sunni as most Palestinians are, but is based in Lebanon. So, has not really reacted in solidarity with Hamas. They're, they're, they're shooting some rockets, but their leader came out and basically said, like, the attack was all Palestinian. You know, he wasn't saying it that way, but it was almost like, no, really, it's, I had nothing to do with this. Iran has basically claimed they've not had nothing to do with it either. The U.S. government has said that they believe them. And so this remains a conflict that I believe will be contained to Israel. Now, what I can see in terms of, you know, there's a lot of concern about it becoming a regional war. Sure, I think the easiest scenario that I can see it becoming a regional war is if Israel decides to invade parts of Syria and Lebanon to create standoff distance against the various militant groups that do have the ability to launch rockets into Israel. I think that there will be a limited strategic um, benefit of that. But sure, I can see it happen. Certainly, Israel did that in 2006. And certainly, you know, it was 30 kilometers away from Damascus in 1973, speaking of the Yom Kippur War. So I can see them doing that. I can also see Israel doing that for political reasons, you know, because the current government of Benjamin Netanyahu failed massively in securing Israel. I think it's going to fail in, de in defeating Hamas. That's like an impossible goal of eradicating Hamas. That's you know, good luck with that. And so I can see them being pushed into doing something more to kind of justify their perseverance. And so, yes, I can see the conflict expanding into southern Lebanon and southern Syria. I don't see that really mattering to anyone in the region. And I don't, I don't see anyone retaliating against that. Really, an invasion of Lebanon, forgive my ignorance, but how did that end in, in 2006? And did, did Israel end up claiming any territory? Because an invasion no. of a country, to me, seems like a big deal on something that could, you know, uh, fan the flames of a, of a geopolitical conflict, conflagration. No one will come to Lebanon's or Syria's aid. And so 2006, the six, Israel ended up withdrawing. Uh, that ended up uh, causing a government collapse. In fact, that war, in a way, brought Benjamin Netanyahu to power because it was seen as a as a really waste of time to Israel to have done that. And by the way, they did not eradicate Hezbollah. Hezbollah grew stronger afterwards, which might be a lesson for their current operations against Hamas. The other issue is that in Syria, they've been operating, Israel has been operating in Syria pretty much without anyone stopping them, certainly since 2011. 
and even before that. So Israeli aircraft regularly bomb targets in Syria, including Iranian targets, especially weapon shippings. And recently, Israeli fighter jets bombed Aleppo, which is on the border of Turkey. So we're talking about a region where invading a country is not isn't worth what you know you may think it is in sort of like a big picture. But but the real issue here is that Iran, which is the only country that could maybe you know take it upon itself to defend its allies, Hezbollah in Lebanon or its troops in Syria, is extremely afraid of U.S. retaliation. And I mean this is clear. I'll give you an example of this. In 2020, right before COVID, the biggest geopolitical issue was that the United States assassinated. General Soleimani, who was the head of the elite Quds Force, while he was on his way to meet Iraqi leadership in Iraq. He was on a diplomatic mission and the U.S. killed him. And Iran didn't really retaliate. It bombed two U.S. bases, but it did so in a way where pretty much they kind of phoned the Americans and said, hey, we're going to bomb this base at 5 p.m. Please move your troops out. And then they stopped. That was the only thing they did. And General Soleimani was very popular in Iran. There were rumors that he would actually run for president in the subsequent election. So this was a very, it's like General Petraeus, you know, and the Iranians didn't really do anything to defend their, you know, like hero, like a really prominent member of the establishment in Iran. So why would they do anything now to retaliate against what Israel is doing? I don't think they will, because they understand that the U.S. is a huge constraint on their operations and U.S. will defend Israel's interests if Iran gets involved. That's been pretty much clearly stated to Iran. So I don't see how this really escalates into a major geopolitical conflict. And on top of all of that, what's really interesting is that Saudi Arabia and Iran have solved a lot of differences. So while Iranian proxies like the Houthis or Hezbollah are reacting to Israel, nobody has taken shots at Saudi Arabia, which Houthis have done in the past, in 2019, 2021. There were there were attacks in Saudi facilities repeatedly over, over the course of this decade. That hasn't happened. And that suggests that there's a new equilibrium forming between the Arab and the Muslim states with, with each other. You know, there was a big conference in Riyadh. President of Iran, Raisi, actually came to Riyadh. There was a joint statement. That, that's very unusual. And it suggests that this may escalate in terms of Israel escalating but the other countries are not going to escalate against each other. So that gets us to the market implications. For you to care about this as an investor in the United States, this needs to escalate beyond Israel. It needs to escalate beyond the Levant. The Levant is a great place to go to and visit some historical sites. Levant does not matter for macroeconomics. You know, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, do not matter for the global economy. Sorry to be so glib, but that's a fact. And so what you need as an investor, for this to really matter to you, it needs to go out of that region, the Levant, and it needs to go to the Persian Gulf. And if Saudi Arabia and Iran have this new equilibrium that they formed after their diplomatic relationship was restored in 2022, supposedly with China's help, by the way, as we all learned, but if they're not going to you know, fight amongst each other, then it's difficult to see how this escalates to the oil markets. And, and that's why oil prices have actually collapsed since yeah. the conflict started, which is very counterintuitive. And, and by the way, it surprised me. Day one when this started, I was probably the only geopolitical expert in the world that was very sanguine about it and said, no, nah, it's not going to matter. But even I thought there would be some you know, geopolitical risk premium in oil prices, at least like 5%, 10%. That hasn't happened. And I think that- Or at least them not going down. But <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I mean, like what I would say is that that sends us a very important message about where we are in the macroeconomic cycle. I think that tells us a profound, it tells us a wealth of information about where the U.S. economy is going. I think, I think it's a real alarm bell when oil prices are basically heading down, even though there is this conflict. And again- I'm the most sanguine person probably in the world in terms of this not spreading. But even mm-hmm. I said like, hey, look, man, there's some probability of this, of me being wrong. I'm just a guy writing research on the beach in Santa Monica. Like, I think gold has caught a bid. Can you speak to the value of, of gold or, or you know, gold tends to rally when there is a sense of a geopolitical risk, when there is a war? And do you think that is, I mean, to me, it's so silly that what, the, is the world repricing the odds that 
you know, the world's going to go back to a gold standard. Like I, you know, it's just, and everyone else is bidding up gold because they know everyone else is going to bid up gold, you know, and there's no real fundamental reason. Well, listen, I, you know, I've been very bullish gold really since January of this year. And that's because in 2022, something weird happened. Something very strange happened all of last year. Real rates went through the roof. Gold did not collapse. You know, it just, and this chart was very strange. So at the beginning of 2023, you know, I had two options. Either I, the chart should close with gold collapsing and I should be bearish gold. Or there's a new paradigm where gold is not responding to real rates. And I think there is a new paradigm. So gold is well bid because of a move away from the dollar by currency reserve managers at central banks. Clearly, there's a central bank buying going on uh, when it comes to gold. Move away from the dollar. Many countries saw what happened during the Ukraine conflict where Russian reserves were basically seized. And they're saying like, look, we want some physical assets. That's the number one issue. The number two issue is now I think that the real rate move is over. You know? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's a bigger reason why gold has gone up than geopolitical risk in the Middle East. Because again, if there was actual risk of wider conflict, then I'm telling you, oil should go up. So the gold move must be completely unrelated to geopolitical risk in the Middle East. I think the bigger geopolitical story to gold is the move away from the dollar. By again, not everyone, but just, you know, basically reserve managers at central banks, fine. And then the real rates move is over because the Fed is clearly backing off. I want to be very clear. When you say people moving away from the dollar, you are not talking about people buying oil in Chinese yuan or no. Bitcoin. You're talking about foreign central banks, instead of owning you know, almost exclusively or mostly U.S. Treasury dollar-denominated assets, U.S. So sovereign government bonds, they're owning a little bit more gold as well, and so they're, they're buying it. Yeah, just a little bit more, and that's enough. Just a little bit more, and, and we saw that in 2022. That clearly kept gold bid when it shouldn't have. Gold should have collapsed in 2022 when the Fed embarked on a very aggressive rate hiking cycle and inflation went up. In terms of the overall geopolitics and in terms of markets, you think that the the impact of uh, the Israel-Hamas war will be limited. Is that fair to say? Yes, it is. And I, I can tell somebody listening to this podcast at this point is like, well, this guy clearly doesn't think anything matters ever. <laughs> you know, I, what I would say is like, well, Hold on a second. The big story of our time is that we're in a multipolar world where no one country or two countries are really in charge. And so the frequency of these geopolitical conflicts is going to be higher than what most of us are used to. So, you know, buckle up. This is, this is the world we live in today. What I think is interesting is that the journalists and the geopolitical tourists and kind of like, you know, like, the, the, the narrative writers out there haven't mm -hmm. figured this out. So they're freaking out every time there's a conflict. The market, however, seems to be quite comfortable with this level, this frequency of geopolitical conflict, because it's kind of learning to, to adjust to it. And of course, again, I'm not a believer in the efficient market hypothesis. I don't think the market is right all the time. But I think we need to stop and listen to the market, not just shake our fists and say, like, well, the market's wrong. I want to be long oil because the world is going to end. And so I think the market has become aware that the frequency of geopolitical conflict will be higher. And so the half-life of the risk premium is getting shorter and shorter. And in the case of Israel, Hamas, it never really even happened. I mean, except for a couple of days, you know, in the case of Ukraine, Russia, oil prices stayed up until June. Commodities like wheat and other commodities fell in May. So it really took most commodities three months, oil about four months. So the half-life of that geopolitical conflict was about four to six months, depending on the asset. In Israel, Hamas's case, it was, you know, measured in days. And I think that's very interesting that the market is becoming aware of the geopolitical context it exists in. This is a multipolar world. We know from political science theory that when the world is multipolar, frequency of geopolitical conflict goes up. But, but it doesn't mean that these end up in a World War III scenario. In fact, there's many reasons why they can't. And, and what are some of those reasons? No nuclear, nuclear weapons? 
I, I like how you ask that follow up question. I set it up for you because it's like it's hanging there. Like, well, yeah, why not? Like, we we might want to know. Like, wait, they'll stop there. Like, oh, should well. I sleep well? Should I sleep? I well took the bait. Not? Yeah. No. The, so yes, I think nuclear weapons is is an obvious one. But there's another one. There's an interesting one, Jack. You know what it is? See, in a bipolar world, in a bipolar world like the Cold War, you know, you've got two countries. Every conflict immediately gets grafted onto this bipolar reality, almost instantaneously. Every conflict. You know, if the Russians didn't have a position on some civil war somewhere, once the Americans picked a side, the Russians picked the other one. Mm -hmm. This is the Cold War. Everything, everything was just neatly grafted. And therefore, everything became a potential tripwire to nuclear holocaust. So in a multipolar world, it's messy. You know, it's messy and alliances shift. And this is why being a geopolitical tourist is very dangerous. I see this on Twitter all the time. People making these connections, you know, with thread and like, it looks like, you know, like conspiracy. Yeah. Theories. Like, look, Turkey can be on one side in one conflict, on another side, in another conflict. Whose side is China on? Israel or Hamas? I don't know. I don't know either. And I'll tell you why. Because China's on America's side when it comes to Middle East. Wait, what? Record skips. What are you talking about? <laughs> China is a huge consumer of oil, specifically from the Middle East. So China has an interest in this not blowing out of proportions. They, they have an interest in Iran and Saudi Arabia working together, continuing to ship oil, both of them, to China, not making this into a regional conflict. So in a way, China and the United States have both an interest in containing this conflict, not having it blow up. Again, that's not what you would have seen during the Cold War, where it was very rare for the Soviet Union and the U.S. to cooperate and dampen tensions anywhere. In a multipolar world, conflicts come and go. They don't necessarily graft themselves onto a neat distribution of power that then becomes a tripwire for superpower conflict. And so we've seen that in this particular case. In, in Russia, Ukraine was a little bit more like a bipolar conflict because you saw Europe and U.S. on one side. China helping out Russia in, in some ways. But even there, you had countries like India. You know, India is nominally or supposedly an ally of the U.S. against China. But it's out there sw- bathing itself in Russian oil. You know, so this, this, is, this is the complexity of a multipolar <laughs> world where it, it just gets messy. And it doesn't mean that every conflict leads to World War III. And yes, then your point about nuclear weapons, I think, is more important. I just... You know, there is this other one that people don't think about. But nuclear weapons certainly make it very, very costly to elevate these conflicts to superpower level. Yeah, just to make the the people who you you imagine saying, oh, but Marco, you never imagine that this is going to be systemic and lead to something big. I'll I'll get, throw them a, a bone and say, what would you know, Marco Popovich in 1912 before World War One or yeah, uh, nice. you know, 1939 before World War Two? Well would, would Marco Popovich be saying, this is a nothing burger? Because it wasn't uh, a nothing burger. <laughs> no, well, I'm from Serbia, so I would have been cheering on the murder of the crown prince. Just kidding. Uh, that's how the war started. You know, we killed him, basically, my people. No, look, what I would have said is that the world ceased to be multipolar. Why? By 1905, and this is where I will tell you, this is where I'll call you and say, let's do another podcast because the world has changed. So if we have a very clear alliance structure that once a conflict is triggered, the alliance structure is triggered, and there's war, then we, are, we have a problem. And that existed in Europe because Russia, France, and the United Kingdom were in a military alliance that would have been triggered if, they were, if any one of them was attacked by Germany or Austria-Hungary. And so the world had ceased to be truly multipolar. It became very bipolar. You know, on one side you had Russia, France, and the United Kingdom. On the other side you had Austria-Hungary and you had Germany and Turkey to some extent as well. Even though there wasn't, maybe the, the hegemon was maybe the Great Great exactly. Britain still, but when you say bipolar, it wasn't one power versus one power. It was like three powers who were in a group against two other, three, three other powers that were in a group. Well, they created an extremely, extremely dangerous military alliance structure that was triggered right away with no ability to, 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 to like slow it down. So Serbia murders the crown prince of Austria-Hungary Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia. Russia declares war in solidarity with Serbia against Austria-Hungary. Germany declares war against Russia. It triggers basically 
France and the United Kingdom to declare war right away. So this immediate, quick alliance structure made it difficult to have an independent reaction function. And so a small conflict uh, was grafted on to a bipolar structure. So yes, there wasn't one or two countries that were the most powerful, but the groupings themselves ossified into military camps. It was like two basically large military camps made up of countries. Are military, so obviously you want people, you, you want countries to get along and have you know, positive diplomatic relations, but are military alliances where if, if you know, Jack is invaded, then Marco has to inv invade whoever invaded Jack. Are those dangerous as, as they were in World War I? And, you know, if they're, are they dangerous now? And if they're not dangerous now, what was so, you know, toxic about them in, you know, early 1900s? I would say that they are dangerous now. You know, I, I, I do think they are dangerous now. So if Russia and China, if Russia and China were cre to create the military alliance uh, beyond their, like, endless friendship, whatever it is that they call, you know, the, which is nothing. It's a complete nothing burger. Clearly, because China's not really supporting Russia the way they would a true ally. They're not. They're not shipping the weapons. So the the danger in military alliances is that a small conflict can then, you know, bring China into Europe. A Russia's involvement in Moldova. Let's say there is a crisis in Moldova and Russia decides to defend Transnistria, which is the part of Moldova they have troops in which is some kind of a semi-sovereign part. You know, this is a country in the middle of nowhere. Nobody cares about it, really. And then suddenly, because of China and Russia's military alliance, China has to send troops to defend Russian interests. So in a way, they are, they are dangerous. Now, we in the West obviously see the collective defense of NATO as a positive. And I would say it is positive, but it has a very focused objective at defending European sovereignty and focusing just on Russia. But if NATO had an equivalent sort of grouping sitting across of it, as it did during the Cold War and the Warsaw Pact, you know, then you are in a bipolar system where the two sides, you know, could go to a massive war over a stupid, stupid little conflict somewhere. And that's not really a positive. Now, the war was like the war didn't happen during the Cold War. But, you know, Jack, if it had happened, it would have been a world war. Like the Warsaw Pact versus NATO, those structures guaranteed that we would have had a world war if there had ever been a conflict across those lines. Now, one thing that I would say also about, you know, the current situation is that there's just there's multiple large independent players that I think is very interesting that didn't really exist in World War One. So countries like India countries like Turkey, even though it's a NATO member, countries like Saudi Arabia, you know, these are large players and they often kind of pivot and play wedge against these alliance structures. So that's that's also, I think, a positive. You know, a unipolar world, one geopolitical hegemon is kind of you know, setting the pace for the rest of, of the world. Bipolar is, you know, two countries r running things. You know, multipolar is three or more. What's what when you say, oh, that country is a power, that country or that country is a great power. Uh, what makes you say that? In other words, oh, Germany became a great power in the 1900s. France, you know, was a great power. UK you, and the United States became a great power. Then the Soviet Union, you know, Russia became became a great power. Maybe Russia is no longer a great power. What makes you say that? Is it purely based on your population? Because like the, the Qing dynasty, you know, what is now China, I think, you know, I had like a third of the global population, a huge population boom in the 1800s, but I don't think people consider them a, a great power. So is it, is it just military? Is it economic? It's, is it just population? When, what, what makes you say that or, or assert this is a unipolar world with you know, this country is, is running things? I think it's an ability to pursue a foreign policy independent of any other country. I think that is a true like emblem or characteristic of a great power, being able to pursue an independent foreign policy. Now, during the Cold War, Germany could not pursue an independent foreign policy. Very few countries really could. I mean, France tried. Think about the Suez Crisis, 1956-57. You know, France, United Kingdom, and Israel decide to take the Sinai and the Suez Canal from the Egyptians. And America says, nah, you don't get to do that. Sorry, give it back. And they were like, okay, 
You know, like this literally happened. Like these are nuclear powers, by the way. These are nuclear powers, colonial powers, empires. And the U.S. picks up the phone and tells the Brits, like, look, we're going to crash the pound if you don't withdraw. Tell your buddies Israel and France, no, you don't get to get Sinai. That is an example of two things. One, the preponderance of power, the preponderance of power, which is a term political scientists use, you know, that is required for a hegemon to truly maintain a unipolar order. Or, or at least in a bipolar world for, a, for one of the two superpowers to keep its allies in check. Preponderance of power. And I would argue that nobody has that today, even though quantitatively the U.S. is clearly still the most powerful country in the world. It's head and shoulder above everyone else. But to maintain a unipolar order, they need to be head, shoulders, torso, hips above everyone else, you know? So this is why, by the way, a lot of Americans, especially American analysts, like scoff at this idea of multipolarity. And then they start doing something I call aircraft carrier counting. Like, well, we have 11, blah, 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 blah. You know, did you look at our R&D spending or VC spending? And I'm like, yeah, it's cool. I get it. Number one, yay. But again, preponderance of power comes with being preponderantly powerful. That's the first thing that it illustrates. The second thing it illustrates is what, is, what makes a great power. And I would say, again, can you pursue an independent foreign policy? So like Turkey invading Syria, Turkey invading Iraq multiple times, the, the Kurdish region in Iraq. You know, Turkey doing things that the U.S. doesn't want them to do is a good example of a country that is acting as if the world is not unipolar. That would not have happened during the Cold War. Turkey and Greece famously had a war over Cyprus that was, again, clamped down by the Americans. Uh, like, hey, you guys can't go to war. Your NATO member states behave accordingly. Settle it um, like adults. You know, today you have multiple countries like Turkey that have the ability to pursue a foreign policy independent of one another, even though they're not superpowers. And I think that is a that is proof, that's evidence that the world is multipolar. In other words, don't be too obsessed with data. Don't try to prove multipolarity empirically. It's very difficult to do so because, again, You'll just end up saying U.S. is the most powerful country in the world, which is true. You infer from behavior of states that the world is multipolar. Too many countries are not listening to America. Too many countries are not listening to China, certainly. You cannot claim that we're in a bipolar world either. What is China's current foreign policy? What, what are China, China's global foreign policy ambitions? Like what is Xi Jinping and, and the Communist Chinese Party leadership, what do they want, you know, the next 10, 20 years to look like? You know, presumably they want China to have be, be more of a great power, but how much of that is military? Because you know, you can say there are some, you know, countries like like Japan, you know, clearly had very, you know, imperial ambitions in, in you know in the 1900s and so, so did so did Germany for the first half of the the, 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 the 1900s. You know, the, the entire history of China China often, you know, is on the defense. You know, now maybe is it going to be on 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 offense? Is it is it fair to say that China, you know, does China want to want to rule the world? Is kind of my rough way of my my asking a question. I think you know I'm I come from a realist school of political science, so I would argue yes, and they should. God bless them. Like every country should want to rule the world, not because you're mean or evil or you want to make everyone speak Mandarin, just because that's ultimate security. You're, you're ultimately safe by acquiring as much power as you can. So this is very much like John Mersheimer's thesis, mm -hmm. the tragedy of great power politics. The reason he wrote this book and the reason he titled it The Tragedy is because it's tragic. It, it, it's not because countries are mean. It's because they're trying to pursue security for themselves that they end up falling into this Greek tragedy of conflict. You know. So that said, I do think that we have to understand that while China definitely has interests in controlling its sphere of influence, just as the U.S. did in the Western Hemisphere, the difference is that there is cyclicality to this secular view. You know, and we as investors should be very much aware of the difference between having a secular. You're like you could be a dollar bear, but tactically or cyclically, you're like a dollar bull. You know, like well, yeah, yeah. you know, like the Fed is raising high king, so I'm going to be a dollar bull. But I think this thing is going downhill over the next decade. Or you're a dollar bull, but the dollar's just rallied twenty percent. So you're like, look, I'd be dumb if I told people to buy the dollar here. Like it's clearly, you have, yeah, like yeah. the move has kind of wasted itself. And I think in mm. the case of China, I would say they were aggressive. They were assertive. 
You know, they were throwing out nine dash lines, which is this ludicrous claim of sovereignty over all of South China Sea, which is like makes no sense for people who don't know it. Just Google image it. It's silly. Uh, China was, of course, building islands in the middle of nowhere where there were no islands and putting military installations on them. This is aggressive stuff. Now, they didn't invade anyone, you know, to their defense, but they were very assertive. And then something sh flipped over the last couple of years. And I think the couple of things that have flipped, number one, Donald Trump getting elected and being very aggressive and in your face woke, woke up China like, wow, America will retaliate against us. The more assertive we are, Americans will be more assertive too. Interesting. We didn't expect that. We thought they were kind of asleep at the wheel. Donald Trump ended that. Number two, they realized that it's not that easy being aggressive. And the Ukraine conflict taught a very valuable lesson, not just to China, but all the other countries trying to kind of become regional hegemons. Like, this is really difficult. Just because the U.S. invades countries every Tuesday, it's not as easy when you do it, you know, because you don't have the experience in doing so. And especially with Taiwan, if Russia struggled to do something of a country next door, try crossing the Taiwanese Straits with the military. It's very difficult and complicated. And the final thing is, of course, domestic economic situation, which your listeners will be very much aware of. I think China is in a secular stagnation. I think their household is going to deleverage. Households in China are going to deleverage for the rest of this decade. You know, they are where the U.S. was in 2009. So internal source of demand, the internal growth engine is going to be impaired for five, maybe 10 years. How, how long was secular stagnation for Americans? Yeah, close to 10 years. But 2009 was a good, great time to buy U.S. stocks. No, no. And, and certainly I'm not, you know, we can talk about the markets in a second. All I'm saying is yeah, from yeah. a geopolitical perspective, this is another humbling of China. Like, whoa, whoa, this is, we need external markets. We need Europeans. We need Americans. We didn't think we did, but we do. And I think that, so again, what I want to, I want to be respectful to the thesis that a realist would have, which is that China has a rational interest in acquiring as much power as it can. But I would also say that cyclically, for the next five years, I can forecast that they're going to be humbled. And Xi's visit to, to, to Biden yeah. in San Francisco is evidence of this. You know, it, it's a real problem for Xi to meet Biden on American soil. For the protocol-obsessed Chinese, this is, a, this is a big kind of tip of the hat to the U.S. Xi didn't meet him at the G20 summit in a neutral country because... Clearly, the U.S. had insulted China, quote unquote. And then suddenly, a couple of months later, they're saying, OK, fine, you know what? We're going to go and meet you. And, and the conciliatory tone of Xi was quite interesting. We're noticing on the ground in China, more and more state media trying to paint U.S. not as an ally, but as a partner. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and one of the arguments is like, oh, my God, look at all this risk. Israel, Hamas, Ukraine, Russia. We need to work with the American partners as responsible superpower. The two of us, we have, you know, a common interest in making sure the world doesn't descend into war. So the Chinese government, I think, has been humbled. And I think it's turning towards a little bit more of a conciliatory position, at least for the next five years, largely as a result of domestic economic conditions, but also, I think, by just see, observing what's happening around the world and realizing, I think, you're never going to admit this, but what I would say is that I think that if they could speak honestly, they would say, you know what? We got way too aggressive in 2012, geopolitically speaking. And it wasn't a moment. You know, this was way too early for us to try to challenge the U.S. We need more time. Obviously, the U.S. is not going to play ball. And so there we have a conundrum. You know, can, can China remain cool under pressure, under extreme American pressure? There will come, whether it's the Biden or the Trump administration. Can they continue to say, like, no, you know, we don't want to fight. We're going to take our toys and leave the sandbox. Like, we're good. We're going home. Can they continue to do that? And I think that will be the big question for the next five years. And by the way, you asked me earlier, what causes Marco Papic to care about systemic nature of conflict? Israel, Hamas, no, it doesn't. But China, U.S. over Taiwan or over any other part of Southeast China, it would. Right now, my thesis is the Chinese are kind of humbled. They're focusing on domestic issues, but if that changes, then we have a problem. And then we should have geopolitical risk premium across various assets. 
So that's over the next decade. Long term, do you think it is inevitable that China will, will attempt to take over Taiwan? And can you remind us of, I forget the name for it, but, but U.S. policy towards Taiwan, where it maybe has a military alliance, but it doesn't necessarily recognize Taiwan? Yeah, so it's, you know, it's purposefully ambiguous. You know, because obviously we don't recognize Taiwan as a, as an independent country. At the same time, the question is, would we defend it? It's it's ambiguous. It's strategic ambiguity. So what I would say is is a couple of things. A long time is a very long time. It's difficult to to figure out. But what I, I will say one thing. You know, when I said I don't care what Zelensky says, I truly don't. Like he is not my friend. You know, he is a subject of my analysis. You know, and similarly, she is not my friend. He's a subject of my analysis. So why should I care what he says in his speeches? Obviously, every Chinese president is going to say that at some point they're going to reunify with their wayward province of Taiwan. Like that's you have to say that. I mean, it's 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 part of your sovereign territory. The, the issue is this. I don't know to what extent it's really relevant to China to reunify with Taiwan. It's not necessary at all in any way, shape or form. And it's not necessary because Chinese Communist Party has been a legitimate power and a legitimate representative of China, or legitimate government of China, for the past, you know, 80 years without ever having conquered or attacked or thought about doing so with Taiwan. Their legitimacy is, 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 is assured. Nobody in China is clamoring for the reunification. It is a desire, but it's not like in any way a strategic necessity. And so I'm not sure that they need to do that. I, I, I don't think that they have to. And so will they do it? I think the only way it happens is if it's a fair complete. And what that means is that China will reunify with Taiwan when it's so overwhelmingly powerful because of economic development and technological innovation that there's nothing anyone, including Americans or the Taiwanese, can do about it. That is the only way that I see China reunifying with Taiwan. Until then, I think the risks are way too high. Now, Americans see it differently. You know, American view is that they have to reconquer Taiwan because America is obsessed with a view of geopolitics that emphasizes oceans and seas and control of, of naval rights. And this comes from, obviously, the bias that America has because it's so far from the rest of the world. It has used oceans as a way to control wayward interests that it may have. I'm not sure that China has to pursue the same way of domination that the United States and the United Kingdom before it have used. China has an alternative route to naval domination, and it's the Eurasian continent. It's the landmass. It's the giant, you know, basically part of the planet that if it was unified under a single dominant power, wouldn't have to build a single ship. Like, let me say that again. If you controlled Eurasia, you control so much wealth and technological innovation in Europe. You control so many natural resources that you don't have to have a single boat. Americans can have 75 nuclear-powered aircraft carriers zooming around your Eurasian landmass. You don't care. You're like, hey, what's up? Have fun out there. You know, hope you're getting enough sun. You know, put some sunscreen. Because we have everything we need on this Eurasian landmass. And I think the Chinese... Policymakers are kind of struggling with this. They are building a navy, which I think is a mistake. I wouldn't be if I was them. I would cede control of the seas to America. Have it. At the same time, they have this belt, one belt, one road initiative, which is focused on this other geopolitical view, you know, which is like, hey, let's just build infrastructure to suck the natural resources out of Russia and to uh, <clears throat> be connected to the European markets. And it's going to be interesting to me to see whether Chinese policymakers themselves come to terms with these two conflicting views of what it takes to be a hegemon. Now, the planet hasn't seen a continental hegemon in a very long time. We haven't seen a really, really powerful country without really a, a dominant navy in a very long time. And I mean, you know, China could elect to do that. And if they do, then they truly don't need Taiwan. Taiwan is only kind of important if you're thinking of expanding navally and you want to get that first island chain and the second island chain. These are the, the topics that dominate American strategic thinking. But as I said, it makes sense for America because it's so far away from these parts of the world to have land bases and lily pads. Maybe it doesn't make sense for China 
if it becomes a land land based power. And that land based power does that mean invading other countries or just kind of taking them over economically? You know, how how do they exert that power over like you know, Mongolia, for example? I mean, I guess it depends, you know, but but there is a worldview in China that they don't have to invade other countries. And certainly like the U.S. doesn't invade and hold other countries. I mean, other than Iraq and Afghanistan, for the most part, you know, the U.S. has exerted that power through alliance structures and through quid pro quos that benefit members of this alliance. I mean, the U.S. was a benevolent hegemon. I think, you know, non-Americans probably scoff at that idea. I think it's fair to say it kind of has been for the most part. And I think it's created very beneficial alliance structures. So China would have to figure out how to do that. One of the ways to do that is to give access to its internal economy, to its potential economic allies. And so for that to happen, by the way, they first have to have a healthy domestic economy, which is, again, takes us back to the cyclical point. But over the long term, yeah, as a realist, I have to tip my hat to the idea that U.S. and China conflict is inevitable. I respect that. I respect Graham Allison, his Thucydides trap concept. Obviously, John Mershimer, who I would argue is like a mentor and, and someone who I respect immensely. But at the same time, I can see a future where China chooses to be that challenger to the U.S. in a way that minimizes their need to compete with the U.S. directly on America's turf. Certainly, if I was running China, I would just say, you know what, we're not going to play America's game. We're just not. We're not going to play, you know, your naval dominance. We'll spend our money on another way. It's like it's like sports. Why are you trying to outshoot the Golden State Warriors? You're never going to shoot three pointers as well as them. So take the ball inside. You know, learn how to pound the ball in the paint, dominate the paint, seed the three point contest to them, control the paint, like as, as a way to counter something that you don't have. And I think in China's case. You know, trying to build a blue water navy to counter the U.S. is a mistake. It, it's not a smart way to to spend money. What is your view on economic policies between China, China and the, the U.S. and capital flows? You know, policies. There was a time a lot of money was flowing into into China. Obviously, China has a huge uh, you know trade surplus with with the rest of the world and and the United States in particular. Uh, but there have been, I think there was an executive order by by, by Biden, the uh, so, so-called reverse CFIUS. You know, it was much, I think, less strong than some were anticipating. But I mean, you, you tell me what it, what it does, but it you know, restricts particularly you know, sensitive to national security investments in China. I mean, an extreme version of that is no money is allowed to go in China at all, just like no money is allowed to go into to Russia at all. We're, we're very far from that. But do you think those will, will escalate as, as well? And then also, you maybe talk about you know, the, the tariffs that the U.S. puts, up, puts on China. Uh, you know, obviously, there's been also the technological. So Commerce Department had the export ban on semiconductors in October 2022. There's just a, a slew of, of these things. I would say that multipolarity is a very important concept because, you know, it prevents a country like U.S. from getting its way. Why? Because it's very difficult to coordinate with allies. It's very difficult to coordinate with allies. You can coordinate with them on very limited things, like super advanced semiconductors, fine. You know, Japan and the Netherlands are going to be like, okay, America, like, we'll do it. But you try telling France not to sell Airbus airplanes to China. Good luck with that. Like, no way. They're going to be like, all right, sure. So that's where it becomes a problem, because if suddenly every single Chinese order is just Airbus airplanes... Boeing is going to knock on your door of the White House and say, like, hey, man, do you want us to develop hypersonic cruise missiles? Because if you do, we need revenue from China. We need to sell them 1990s technology of, you know, wide body aircraft. Who cares if we sell them 737s? You know, like the world's not going to end if America sells China some aircraft. And so that becomes a real impediment to complete breakdown in trade. And this is something that I think that the Biden administration and the Trump administration before it kind of woke up to. You know, they, they walk in, they're like, oh, China, rivalry. Yes, let's go. We know this playbook. We got it. Like, let's pick up the Cold War playbook. You know, all right, everyone, let's contain China. And they look around and then no one's standing next to them except Australia. Australia's like, hey, we're here. Like, what do, we, what do you guys want to do? 
You know, and they're like, where's France? Where's UK? Where's Italy? What's going on? Where's Japan? Ah, it's not so easy. They still want to trade with China. And if they want to trade with China, you have to trade with China. Because why wouldn't you? I mean, like, it's just stupid not to trade with China if your allies are making money off it. Well, the argument is that you could stimulate the domestic U.S. economy more by producing it at home, even if that's inflationary. You know, that will keep the unemployment rate low, that, that will keep people happy. In other words, because China produces so much and consumes so little and produces a lot more than it consumes, they are, they are much a, a bigger seller than they are a buyer. But that's, uh, but that's a reshoring argument. You know, you can reshore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. But like, you still have to sell them Boeing airplanes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Because if you don't, the French will. You know, and so that, that competitive nature and that inability to coordinate with allies creates an, a paradox which is that in a multipolar world, enemies trade with one another. And so it becomes the ultimate constraint on this complete decoupling from a country. So you can reshore manufacturing, that's fine, but you're still trading with China. And that's why, that's why what I would say to you is the U.S. will continue to impose restrictions on investment, on high-tech exports and trade, but it's going to be very difficult for it to go beyond this very sort of specific and very high tech breakdown in trade. And then just on, on the point of China, is is money safe in, in China? You know, if you invest in some of China's you know, great, great tech companies, are they is that money going to be returned to shareholders eventually? Like if you invest in Apple, every iPhone you, you know, okay, that's that's going to the investors ultimately, whether it's redeploying growth, that will just increase the value of the, the company. But there's a you know a big question mark with the, you know, the, the Chinese government. And then you know when you, when foreigners invest in, in markets in, in you know publicly traded Chinese securities, it's it's through an entity in the Cayman Islands that has a variable interest interest entity that say okay we have effective control, but we don't actually you know own it to, to some effect. I think the the geopolitical risk premium for that is quite high because uh, you know many Chinese equities are are quite uh, cheap right now if you just look at the market. So yeah, what's your view on that? And does that does that shape your view on if there's opportunities in the Chinese equity market? I mean, I think there will be a huge buying opportunity in Chinese markets um, over the next you know 12 or 18 months. It's just really difficult to time because Chinese policymakers themselves need to number one satisfy you on that question, which I don't think they have. They're starting to. I mean, she going to U.S. is a good start. But the second, more importantly, is they need to stimulate the economy more. They need to become aware that they're in a secular stagnation and that the only way to fix an economy where the private sector is deleveraging is for the public sector to re-leverage. And they have been unwilling to do that because they just don't understand that they are in a secular stagnation. So I think that when those two questions get answered, I think you can have a pretty significant rally in Chinese markets. Now, is China a safe investment over the very long term? Well, in private markets, you know, private markets in China are frozen. So they've already spoken, you know, really? private investment in China where you were locked in for 10 years, very difficult to have a, a handle on that. And I think that's appropriate, given the geopolitical tensions we're talking about, the different routes Chinese policymakers can take over the next five to 10 years both in internal and external politics, that's all up in the air. But in terms of public markets, I think it can still be a trade. China can be a very, very interesting trade. Um, the question is, can it really be an investment? And that's something that they're going to have to answer over the next five years. Are they still you know, pro-business, pro-markets, pro-growth, pro-investor or not? Marco, my, my final question is about the upcoming uh, U.S. election What's your, your view on it and uh, who do you think is going to win? And what would the consequences of that be? What's at stake? Look, I will say this. This will be the most extraordinary election, I think, in U.S. history. The third party candidates, it's funny we say third party. I mean, what, what if there's three of them? You know, I mean, we're going to have Jill Stein from the Green Party, which had an impact in 2016 on the election. We're going to have Kennedy, who is polling at 10 percent. And I do think we will have Joe Manchin running under a, a no label um, banner as a candidate as well. And, and I mean, if Joe Manchin gets into the race, you know, you're talking about third party candidates getting a 30% of the vote. Like, I, I think this could be a very serious paradigm shifting election. So why is that important? It's important because somebody like Donald Trump or Joe Biden could become the president of the United States with 30, 35% of the vote, which sets them up for a very interesting kind of loss of confidence by a lot of the public in the leadership because very few voted for them. 
Uh, so that's the first issue, kind of a profound moment in U.S. history. The other issue is that I think that uh, American elites, establishment elites, and I don't mean that in some conspiratorial way. I just mean, you know, both Republicans and Democrats who are part of the establishment, they are much more afraid of Trump 2.0 than they were of 1.0. 1.0 Trump was like a fake populist. He didn't really mean the things he said. He stabbed his cabinet full of Goldman Sachs executives and generals. I mean, you know, he did. And it was very bullish for the market. Trump Cut taxes is huge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Trump 2.0, I mean, he has been disappointed, to put lightly, by all these members of his previous administration. Most of them, in some way, shape, or form, turned on him, whether in writing books or giving interviews or testifying in, in court. And so I think that Trump 2.0 really does mean what he says. In particular, the one thing that the U.S. president does have constitutional power over, which is the federal employment, he, he will try to drain the swamp, you know. And so this creates a real conundrum for the next 12 months if you're Jay Powell, if you're running the Fed. Uh, what if there isn't a slowdown? I mean, I think there will be a growth slowdown, and I think the Fed will use that as an excuse to be extremely lenient, as the market is now forecasting, you know, for uh, 100 basis points worth of cuts. But I think that there's a reason for that, and it's political. And it's that even if the economy is strong, I don't think the Fed can do anything about it, no matter where the CPI print is. Because you have this real existential risk to the way that American federal government works, to the way the American government works. And that risk is that an anti-establishment candidate wins and truly drains the swamp. So if you're the Fed and you're thinking about long-term inflation expectations, what happens if Trump does become the president? What is the biggest risk to inflation expectations? Is it tinkering with CPI with a 25 basis points here or there? Or is it that we have our Nero, you know, that comes, gets elected and says, hey, you know, what did Biden get to do when he won? I believe $2 trillion stimulus. Well, I'm going to have my $2 trillion stimulus. And oh, and Jay Powell, yeah, CPI, I don't really care. Here's a new president. I mean, this is much more bigger, much more important than than, you know, what happens in the next 12 months to CPI prints. And so what is my point? What's my takeaway from here? My takeaway is very simple. I think there's no way in hell the Fed raises rates over the next 12 months, no matter what. Yeah. You know, nominal GDP growth could be 10%. They're not raising rates. Like I'm being obviously obnoxious here, but like, yeah. I, you know, we're at the end of a podcast and I just want to leave you. What do you take from this? Forget what America under Trump looks like. That's, that's something we can talk about in six, 12 months, whatever. That's a cool conversation. Much more relevant is what is the risk of an anti-establishment candidate for the establishment? And I can tell you in France, I can tell you in other countries, the way that the establishment reacts when something like this happens, they, they act like antibodies like against the disease. They all hands on deck. And in terms of monetary policy, that means the Fed will be behind the curve for the next 12 months. So you should be a dollar bearer, I think. And I think you know, U.S. equities could have significant upside over the course of the next 12 months as the market realizes that if there is no recession, they won't hike no matter what. And if there is a recession, they'll cut a lot. If Biden wins, fiscal deficits will continue. If Trump wins, you could have a also very large fiscal deficit of a different flavor. Either way, you're saying the money printing on fiscal deficits will continue and that will be stimulated. Stimulative and inflationary? Well, I mean, that's a more of a conversation for after the election, because we don't know whether mm -hmm. Biden can, can carry the Senate. I think it would be tough for him to do that. But I do think that in, in case of Trump, you have to assume that if Trump wins, he does carry the House and the Senate mathematically. With Biden, you don't. So what I would say is that with Biden, fiscal profligacy probably remains on the current trajectory, which is unsustainable, but it's not Argentina. And with uh, Trump getting elected, like, hey, man, all bets are off. <laughs> you know, it's going to be it's going to be fun. And how are you sort of handicapping the odds of, of who's going to win? I think right now Trump is a clear front runner. You know, I, I really think so. I mean, he's in a head to head polls with Biden. He's ahead of Biden. Biden is the incumbent president who's presiding over inflation that's come down a lot. Nominal GDP growth that's through the roof. Unemployment that's very low. And yet he's losing. Yeah. You know, so you need to paint me a scenario where the economy is better in six months. That's hard. That's very tough. So if yeah. the economy has any kind of a hiccup and Trump's leading right now, then why wouldn't he be leading in six months? 
that's a really good point. The many lawsuits that you know President Trump is in, in engaged in have not derailed it, and you know no. it is quite remarkable. His his popularity remains remains I high. Mean, he seems like you know Teflon Don. Well, I think proving that you know American elites are not very smart, <laughs> and, and I say that because every single time that he gets put under a, a new court yeah. case, yeah. everyone who lives in Manhattan is like, "Yay, this will matter," and he raises forty million dollars off of it. This is this is a very good example of why uh, consensus is something's very wrong. I mean, it, none of that has mattered. Uh, I think what will matter is the economy and the three party can third party candidates and their effect on the distribution of votes. Marco, thanks so much. We'll leave it there. People can find you on Twitter at geo underscore popich. They could read your book Geopolitical Alpha, and they should check out your work at the Clock Tower Group. Thanks so much, Marco. Thank you so much. And sorry I have to go, but this was a lot of fun. Good job. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined.